Hey everybody, it's Lisa, aka Amy's Child, coming at you with another Suits review for a season 9, episode 5, If the Shoe Fits. Now, before we get into it, because I'm trying, I'm going to try to make this one a little quick. So, uh, at least a little bit quicker than I normally do. So, before we get into it, of course, the normal um, housekeeping rules apply. This is not a spoiler free review, so if you haven't seen the episode yet, go ahead and press pause. Come back to us later after you, after you have, and don't forget, keep my channel going so I can bring you this awesomely tubular, totally radical content by, guess what? Hit that subscribe button. Smash that bell. Because if you don't, I can't be here. Anywho, let's get right into it. Season 9, Episode 5. If the shoe fits, and this is the one that everybody's been waiting for since we got the information way back in the fall that Patrick J. Adams was making a triumphant return, even if it is only for one episode. <laughs> he is back as Mike Ross. Uh, apparently, what brings him back is that he is working a case, and the case that he is working, that he is defending, happens to the client that he is going against, happens to be a client of the firm. You remember back in episode one of season premiere of this season when Harvey had to make a grand gesture to uh, Samantha to apologize to her for leaving her in the lurch to go run off with Donna while Samantha was, you know, bowled over by losing uh, Robert Zane and she felt really pissed off because he kind of just left her there and with no ex explanation and then made her think that the reasoning was something other than what it was by lying or just letting her believe something that wasn't true. So he made the grand gesture of giving her some of his clients, including one of his favorites, Brick Street. Yes, Brick Street. This one comes up again. And uh, if, you, if you thought that things were over with Faye now that all the partners had gone to her and, you know, stated their purpose and said back the fuck off in, in episode four, yeah, no. This is only getting worse because, um, Faye did not particularly care for that harshness, so she's biting the ass back. And I, honestly, I gotta tell you, I'm not surprised that it was Samantha to go down first, because Samantha is well known, and okay, I know, I know, in the nine seasons of the show, Harvey's done some shady shit. All of them have done some shady shit, and if Faye was to look into it pretty closely, they would all go down for doing some shady shit. But uh, Harvey and Donna and Lewis at least recognize the error of their ways and are trying to improve and be better lawyers and better people. Samantha consistently defaults to her one way of dealing with problems, and that is digging up shit on people and bearing them with it, with a shovel. If that means coming up with something fake to bury you with, she will do it. I wish that she wouldn't. She's already been told more than once by multiple people at the firm. I'm not, I'm not even talking about Faye, I'm just talking about the partners, the people that she now considers her family, to back the fuck off, to power down, because if she doesn't, she's going to get fucked. This shit that she keeps wanting to do is going to bite her in the ass. Thus far, Faye has stayed off of her radar because she's managed to do her work and defend her clients without doing anything stupid. But now she's come to she's gotten to a boiling point. Uh, for the most part, because Mike, <laughs> and she didn't count on Mike being as good as he is, even though Harvey told her, "Don't underestimate him. He's that fucking good." So anyway, back to the beginning. So Harvey's come home with a pizza, ready to have a cozy night in with his girlfriend. Now, yes, we didn't get much Darby in this episode, but that's okay. We've had a preponderance of Darby for the first four, so it's okay to have one less. Besides, this is kind of setting up the drama that is going to take over the last five episodes. Can you believe we're already at the halfway point? Oh my god, there's only five episodes left. This is going to kind of set up the drama and the plot going forward, starting with Samantha going down in a bucket of flames. <laughs> So, yes, so he's home 
with the pizza, ready to have a nice cozy night in, and he was there, Mike. Uh, he apparently called Don first to let her know that he was in town on business and he wanted to come over for a visit. And she, you know, being the good conscientious girlfriend that she is, figured that the guys would want to have a guy's night. Sorry about that. And so she uh, lets Harvey know that he, she's got plans. An old friend called her up that she, you know, is going to visit with and she'll talk to him later. When we really was just Mike that, that happened to call her. So, you know, she's doing the, the good girlfriend thing and giving, you know, the bromance a little time to thrive. So they're chilling out, having their, their pizza and uh, doing their, their back and forth banter, Rick Sorkin, Hardy, really. <laughs> and Hardy, of course, brings up the question, you know, I know you didn't just drop in here for no reason, so what, what brings you down here? Mike explains that uh, he has, he's working with a client and that client is a, a famous basketball player who was under contract with Brick Street, which is a clothing, uh, sports clothing and memorabilia manufacturing company that they make sports jerseys and other sports paraphernalia. And they tend to contract with a lot of uh, sports figures and celebrities to sell their shit. <laughs> They contracted with this guy, this basketball player, to sell merchandise. And what the basketball player realized was that the company, um, primarily their factories are in China, they were using the conditions at the factories were miserable. And they're paying their 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 uh, workers like twenty cents an hour. Uh, two of the employees committed suicide. The basketball player, player claimed he didn't realize how uh, horrible that the conditions were. So he actually physically went down himself to the factory and saw it with his own two eyes. And now he wants out of the contract because he doesn't want to be associated with it. But there's more to it than just that. That's like the surface violin shit that Mike is playing because it's the easiest card to play. But there's more cards buried beneath it. Hard is like, oh, I don't see you in like a year. And this is what you have. Okay. Okay. See, the, the primary focus of this episode is not just the case itself, but it's this whole question of if we're, no matter what work we do at the end of the day, can we still maintain our friendship? Can we still just be Mike and Harvey, Marty, you know, and put all the work shit aside and leave it at the, the office and go home at the end of the day and just hang out? You really hope that they can, but uh, it seemed like they were going to for a time, but then, you know, shit in the fan. So anyway, um, they kind of set up this friendly competition, but you know, you kind of know that they're going to come at it uh, in a friendly way, that they're not going to rip each other's faces off. Because at the end of the day, I think the two of them really do value their friendship, and they don't want to ruin it. Especially Harvey. Harvey, the way he is now, you know, he's different. And he, he's, if it, was, if it was any other person in the past, you know, Harvey would have, like, done whatever he had to do to screw them over. But Harvey has changed. He's, you know, whatever he's going to do for the client, he wants to do it the right way. And I, I give props to Gabriel Mock. For the writers, you know, for showing this really intense character growth. I know we haven't had a chance to see Lisa Heather. She's only been on the show for like a season and a half. Not even. So she's still growing. But at least Harvey has seen the error of his ways and knows that, you know, if he's not, and he is especially cognizant of the fact that Faye is there and he's watching her every move like Hawk. And then if they're not careful, they're really gonna get hosed. Um, because more than Samantha, he has seen what happens when you do fuck up. Mike going to prison, Don almost going to jail. You know, I think he's at a point now where he doesn't want to do that anymore. He wants to be better, not just a better warrior, but a better person in general. 
So anyway, um, he warns Mike ahead of time that he's not the only one. Well, he doesn't tell Mike about Samantha at first. I think he kind of wanted to bring him on as a bit of a surprise. But he kind of tells him that He's not necessarily alone in this, and it's not going to be as easy as he thinks. So if he's coming here to get his game on, you know, he's going to give it to him. So they hang out, and while they're doing their hangout thing, Lewis and Sheila are doing some sort of weird Cinderella, Prince Charming, sexual fantasy thing that they do. And he literally went out and bought her a $9,000 pair of glass slippers. Holy shit. Like this man had that much money to spend uh, just to complete the, the dance of it. But apparently Sheila's feet are swollen because she's pregnant, which happens, trust me, I know I've been there twice. And uh, her feet won't fit into the slippers. And you know how, I know how women can get when they're pregnant, like I said, I've been there twice. Every little thing can set them off. And they can get angry at the smallest things and they can take it out on the wrong person. And she was definitely, you know, everything that Lewis says, she takes the wrong way. Um, but there's kind of more to it than just her being upset at how she looks, about how she looks, or upset about how Lewis is re reacting or not reacting the way she wants him to. It's more than that. There's some more deep, there's other deep seated things. She's initially upset because she is so uh, exhausted from being pregnant and so deep in her pregnancy fog that she, uh, her mind's not totally on her job, her mind is on the, her child. And she was making a presentation to a potential donor who was supposed to donate $50,000. And she totally flubbed it. Like she said his name wrong, yeah, she messed it up. And the guy pulled out, he, he pulled out. He wasn't good to donate. And that's $50,000 that she lost. So she feels horrible, like she can't do her job. So Lewis, you know, Decides, well, I'm gonna fix this. So he goes to that IT guy, the one that he almost fired before, and promises to uh, he brings him a bag of bacon, something as a bribe, uh, and also finally apologizes for being mass. A couple episodes from a couple episodes be before, apologizes for almost getting fired and asking him to do something that he shouldn't have done. He says, look, this isn't for me, this is for, this is for her. She is feeling really bad that this donor thing didn't work out. I want you to set up a shadow corporation, put $50,000 in it, and then donate it anonymously, you know, so she can get this, so, so she can have this. And he thinks, it, the guy's like, okay, cool. And he thinks, okay, this will be great. She'll be overjoyed. She'll have this money. She won't have to worry. But it doesn't quite work out in his favor. She's even more upset at the fact that he did that. Primarily because in her mind, she feels that if he's doing that, that means that he thinks she can't do her job. And she needs help. I know, it's, it's hard to explain if you've never been pregnant before or if you've never had your mind, if you've never experienced this kind of thing before. It's difficult to explain. So Lewis, they're sitting there arguing and about to rip each other's faces off and it's not getting anywhere. They're just going around in circles screaming mm -hmm. at each other. So Lewis su suggests what is actually a really good idea. He says, I think we should go and see Lipschitz. If anybody can help us, like he helped me, it's him. We need to sit down and talk, talk this out because there's something in here. I do not understand what is going on whatever it is you're not telling me. You're, there's something you're not telling me. So we need to sit down and talk this out. So they decide to, to she's initially hesitant because I don't think she particularly likes Stan very much. But she decides, hey, you know. Anyway, the next morning, everybody's at the office and Samantha is upset because she's found out that client that she's just being given, he's trying to, she feels like he's trying to take it back from her. And he's like, I'm not trying to take a client. 
you want to work on the case together, we can, but I'm not trying to take your client. She already knows that the client is enrolled in a lawsuit. And he says to her, look, I'm not trying to take a client. <laughs> the issue is that the person who's on the other, on the opposing team is someone who's known to me, and I figured it'd just be, because I know the account so well, and because that person is known to me personally, I figured it'd be easier for us to do the back and forth. You know, and he would never let me live it down if, if I lost, you know, he's wanting to come at me, so why don't we just do, you know, just, if you want to sit with me, that's fine. I mean, I don't care. We can do a first, second chair type thing. I'm not trying to steal your client. It's still yours. She's initially hesitant at first, but she's, you know, she's willing to go along with it as long as she's first chair. <laughs> so when they walk into his office, Mike is already there because he's has a, a deposition set up with his client. She's like, who the fuck is this? Because she's, she's never met Mike. She's heard about Mike, of course, but she's never met Mike. He introduces him to her. He's like, okay, this is Mike Ross. Oh, the protege. Okay. She doesn't care. She doesn't know him. She doesn't consider him part of the family. She doesn't give a shit. All she cares about is taking care of her client. She's even more upset at the fact that apparently a deposition was scheduled without her knowledge. And it feels like he's giving up to the other side in her mind. Whoa, no, I'm not. <laughs> Look, Mike is my friend. We've known each other for a long time, and he just wanted to play it cool. Then again, it's no big deal. Like I said, if you want to be in on it, you can. I don't care. <laughs> so again, she's she is obstinate, swearing that this is her case. She's first year, and she will take. She's going to take care of it all. And he's and pretty, that's pretty much the way that Hardy lets her go about it for the most part. He just kind of sits there in the corner and kind of looks on and offers his advice every now and then. But for the most part, he just kind of lets her do whatever she wants to do because he's right; it is her client. You know. So she, they're having this deposition in the office, and Samantha is going at him hardcore. She's asking him why it took him 18 months to even file a grievance against the company about the conditions. And also whether or not he actually had any proof that the conditions he specified were real because he's the only one that's saying it. And he's certain from his eyes or what he saw that they were miserable. But that's only his word. There's no there's nobody else that Back, is backing him up. And the contract said that of the time that he signed, he had 12 months to pull out if he disagreed with their practices or anything like that. He had 12 months to withdraw. Now, six months into the contract, he received a letter from an activist who knew about the conditions and told him, hey, you need to investigate this. This shit is wrong. You need to pull yourself out and away from these people. They're using workers and exploiting them. And at first, he didn't he really didn't think anything of it. He just thought it was some crazy dude that sent him a letter, and he didn't really buy it. But when he actually went down there to the factory and saw it for himself, then but this by then, it was already like a year later. And it was six months after his contract, his ability to remove himself from the contract was already cut off. So right there, they have him in a legal loophole because he missed his time frame by six months. Now Mike counters by saying that he never asked for the letter. The letter was sent to him by some random dude. He never, you know, he never asked for this guy to represent the workers in any way. Samantha says to him, it doesn't matter. The fact is, you were six months too late, and you know it. So when it doesn't matter how many violins you play for the jury in the court, legally, we have you. And we will send you packing on your way when you're in court. Mike knows they're right. But you know Mike. He's always got something up his sleeve. So, the next day, 
actually that same day, uh, Katrina is talking, well, Donna comes to see Katrina because she wants to check up on her to make sure she's okay. You know, it's been a little bit since Brian left and she wants to make sure that she's over Brian or there's anything else she wants to talk about. You know, she wants to make sure she's okay. Katrina doesn't really want to talk about it. She's kind of embroiled in her work and she wants to stay that way. She asks her, have you called him? And Katrina can't even look her in the face, so she knows immediately right there. If the, the very idea of calling him is that disturbing to you, that means you're not with him yet. And you really need to, you know, try to... How about you and I go for drinks after work and we just kind of chill, right? This comes after she, initially, she at first tells her, why don't you give him a call? Even if he doesn't answer or leave a message on his, on his voicemail, get some things off your chest, whatever, just, or say, just say, hi, how, how are you doing? Just call, check up, make sure everything's okay, bye. And Katrina can't even do that right. It's, fortunately for her, uh, the answer, the voicemail, whatever, on Brian's cell phone has a feature where you can, if you don't like the message you left, you can delete it and re-record And she must have done it like 5,000 times <laughs> because she either messed up when she spoke or she said the wrong thing or she said the wrong name or this or that. Or she sounded like a moron. She got to the point where she had to write her own script just to say the right thing. It was that crazy. So she went back to Donna's office. She's like, oh my God, I, I had to literally write a script just to get the words out of that. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not a room. So Donna feels bad for her and says, look, why don't you come out with me after work? Go and have drinks. Just have fun. Just you and me. What do you think about work? You know? And they they do that. And they're chilling and whatever. And Donna brings up to her the opportunity to do what she used to do with Rachel after work, which is... Rachel and I used to do this thing where we would pretend to be the female versions of Harvey, Mike, Harriet Specter, and Michelle Ross. And I do think the name means is up for grabs. So, you know, if we can do that, we can come and suspect men to buy us drinks for free, and it'd be awesome. She's like, you actually do that? Like, that's against the law. You misrepresent yourself. Well, yeah, it's fine. I mean, it's no big deal. Nobody gets hurt. Nice, cute guys flirt with you, you get free drinks, you go home, no big deal. Katrina, you can tell, is totally not comfortable with this. <laughs> Donna's looking at her like, at first she thinks, she starts pointing out different guys around the group. The first one, she's like, oh yeah, you're right, he's, nah. The second guy, oh, he could be Brian's brother. But it's not that. She gets so flustered that she's about to get up and leave because she doesn't want to deal with anybody. So apparently Donna has misread the, the whole thing. She doesn't want to run around conning men out of drinks. She's not even comfortable in her own skin. And it's because prior to this fantasy with Brian, she'd only been in a real relationship once. And I think it failed because uh, she pulled herself out of it and threw herself in, into her work. She put her work before her personal life. Not just her personal life, but her work before her, her own self. So Donna's like, look, you need to not just... You're, this fantasy you had with, with Brian, these feelings that you had, was your sole way of telling you that there's more to life than just your work. You've literally been embroiled in your work for years. You have not taken any time for yourself. You have to do that. So she says, look, here's what we're going to do. I want you to promise me that at least one night a week, you will take for yourself. I don't care if it's cozying up on the couch and reading a good book, going to the gym and having a workout, uh, going to the pool, taking a swim, going to a movie, whatever. Just anything and anything that has nothing to do with work, just for yourself. And that is something that Katrina can do. And for starters, having a drink with a friend. Taking some time out for yourself, being happy with yourself, because how can you be in a relationship if you can't be happy with you? You know what I mean? So, 
the next day when Katrina comes to her and says, I signed myself up for a ballet class. I'm so awesome. She's happy for her, but she isn't able to finish talking to her because she gets a notification on her computer. And that notification turns out to be an article that Mike had published detailing uh, the, the basketball player client of his detailing the conditions that he saw in the factory. She Samantha is peeved because in her mind it's slander mm. for him to go out and say some shit like that without any proof to back it up. And honestly, she's not wrong. I mean, yes, he saw it with his own eyes. If he just if he just taken some pictures or something or recorded a conversation he had with some of the workers, there'd be more backup. He'd have more ammo, but he didn't. He's only going by what he saw with his own two eyes. So that gets him into some serious shit. And she is about to like ram it up his ass. But Donna comes to him, comes to her and says, Look, I know Mike, and I know he's like a dog with a bone. It doesn't matter how hard you come at him, he will not stop. Trust me, I've known him for years, I know how he works. He learned from the best. It's not hard. He knows what he's doing. Don't underestimate his ability. If you want to do this the right way, go to him, sit down, plead this out, come up with some kind of deal that works for both sides, and then you guys can walk away clean. Nobody gets hurt. And you think, hey, yeah, that is the best course of, of action, but when has Samantha ever been able to come up with, to do a decent deal, except for a couple of times, without, you know, sinking the shit? <laughs> She's, she never seems to be satisfied, right? <laughs> so she goes to Mike's place. Well, he's still staying in his old apartment because Harvey still owns it. And she wants to sit down with him and make a deal. Mike's medical and says, hey, you know, we have two wants. Either one, you let him out of his contract, you know, with full payments, or two, you stop making clothing and other items the way you've been doing it, you improve your conditions. It doesn't necessarily have to be both. I mean, the most important thing is the improved conditions. I mean, he's not dumb enough to think that, that they'll do both, but if he can at least get improved conditions for the factory, that'll be a good win. She's like, you know, at first she's considering thinking about it, but he pushes enough of her buttons about what his client did or what he had his client did, do that uh, immediately it blows up in both their faces. And he's like, look, if, if you were coming here to give me, to slap me with a slander suit, you think I didn't see that coming a mile away? I'm coming to fuck off. So she was trying to fall on her sword. But he riled her up and then he pushed enough, pushed enough of her buttons that she was like, fuck it. And she slaps him with that, with that suit, telling him that he needs to take the article down. But he, he's not going to do it. What the fuck ever. Come at me, bitch. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that did not end well. The next morning, Harvey's like, what the hell? I thought I told you to pound me the fuck down and try to figure shit out without doing something so stupid. She she looked at him like, why are you angry? I didn't let him win. I slapped him with a slander suit, which is exactly what you would have done. And he's like, no, I wouldn't have done it because he would have seen it. You think he came out, out here to get slapped with a slander suit? Please, come the fuck on. Who do you think Mike, Mike Ross is? You think he didn't see that coming a mile away? Bitch, please. Even if he fights the suit, the fact of the matter is, it's already out there. And if you try to cover it up with a slander suit, that's all it's going to look like to a jury is that you're trying to cover shit up. You're only making the, the situation worse. So now, while they're arguing about this, Faye has cottoned on to the fact that something is not right. Because she knows Mike 
Ross is there. She knows Mike used to work there. She probably also knows about Mike's history. It's not necessarily Mike himself that is the problem. The problem in her mind is that she thinks Harvey and Mike are too close. And that a situation like that, where there's a friendship between the two attorneys, it could, no matter how it ends, how the case ends, shit could blow up in someone's face. And she's trying to prevent that from happening. She goes to Alex and she kind of nonchalantly asks Alex if he will watch over them. She doesn't say spy, but that's exactly what Alex reads it as. You want me to spy? What the fuck, bitch? No, I want you to oversee. That is the wrong choice of words. Definitely the wrong choice of words. Anyway, she wants him to just kind of watch over them and make sure that whatever they do, they do properly, and that if there's any dust-ups or any chance of impropriety, then it'll be squashed. But Alice is not taking the bait. It's like, no, I'm not. They're my friends. I'm going to trust that they can do their fucking job, like grown-ass people. What? You've already tried to get in the middle of us before. You're not doing it again. Time to fuck off, you know? And she's like, all right, but if it blows up, it's on y'all, not, not me. So, next thing that happens is that the owner of the factory comes in to be deposed by Mike. They've already deposed his client, now he's, now it's his turn. So he starts asking the client questions, just drilling him straight on about the conditions of his factory and that his workers only get paid 20 cents an hour while he's making 20 billion dollars a year and living a cushy life in a mansion that two of his workers committed suicide because of the conditions were, were so bad, blah, blah, blah. And the guy, is, he's just pushing his buttons like this. And you, I could tell from the moment that Mike started that this was all so, like, because normally Mike doesn't go at someone that hard, even if he hates their guts. He normally doesn't go that hard. He's usually soft shoes. And this time he was just like drilling the shit out of this guy. <laughs> I wanted to believe that Harvey knew it. I think he kind of did. Because <laughs> Harvey's not dumb. And everything that Mike knows is something that Harvey taught him. So, <laughs> you could tell that he was purposely trying to get this guy to slip up and say some shit. And wouldn't you know, when he talks to the guy, when he tells the guy that two of your workers committed suicide because the conditions were, were so bad, he's like, I don't give a damn if they if they killed them themselves. My company didn't have anything to do with it. Oh. I knew right there when he said that 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 was going to bite him in the ass. And it did for about 2.5 seconds. But yeah, I knew that that particular line was going to hurt them. They didn't realize it at first because Samantha was like, this is over. It doesn't matter what you say about the conditions in his factory. You can't prove or substantiate any of it, and we still have you over a legal barrel. And before the deposition even starts, Harvey and Harvey and Samantha come up with a way to keep Mike, Mike's client from even testifying in the first place. See, this was originally supposed to be a jury trial. He was going to play his violin for, for the jury. But they want to keep that from happening. So what they did was waive their right to, to a jury trial so it would be heard directly by a judge. This way, it doesn't matter what the client says, no one's going to hear it outside of the judge. Unless you have a bleeding heart judge, you know, it's not really going to matter either way. So Harvey kind of put that one in there, you know, as the icing on the legal cake. But I kind of think that Mike already anticipated this, which is why he went so hard on the factory owner. The guy had to say what he said. So, next up, after it doesn't work out with Samantha, Harvey comes to see Mike to try to talk to him. He's like, look, I'm, I'm not gonna back down here. And he, he puts it to Harvey that, you know, you think that I've become a different Mike because of the way I'm doing business, but I, you know, I'm still me. 
actually no, it's the other way around. He says, you think that, you wanted to think that I'm the same old Mike, but I'm not. I don't let violins tell my story anymore. I'm about results, and I know how to get them, because everything I do is something that you taught me. So, uh, yeah, you're not going to, nothing she does is going to bowl me over or make me change my mind. But his reason for coming there wasn't just to talk about the cakes. He just wanted to make sure there's no peace of mind, no matter what happened at work, no matter what Samantha did, that they were still cool. That everything was going to be okay. Because in his mind, because they, they waived their right to a jury trial, and that they pretty much had Mike over a legal barrel, that there was no way that Mike could proceed any further. And he would just like take a deal on that or that, that would be it. He figured the case was pretty much done. But Mike did not see it that particular way. <laughs> but he just wanted to make sure that, however it worked out, that they were still cool. At the end of the day, they were still harming Mike. Solid romance. Yes? <laughs> but, you know, Mike doesn't entirely answer him. Not entirely. You know, you can tell that like, he's still got something off his sleeve. And he doesn't want to put all his cards out on the table just yet. So while this is stewing, uh, Sheila and Lewis go to see Lipschitz, and they are discussing, and actually they're doing more arguing than discussing, and it comes out in this therapy session. He's trying to get them to role play it out. Lewis really doesn't want to do that. But it comes out that Sheila was more upset at the fact that it's not that she's losing her ability to do her job, but when Sheila was originally first on the show, the reason why she and Lewis broke up in the first place is because she said she didn't want to have kids, that she was dedicated to her job. But then when she got with Lewis again and she got pregnant, her mindset changed. And now she feels like she doesn't know what to do because she loves her job, but she also loves the prospect of being a mom. And now the idea of being a mom is slowly starting to take over the idea of still working at Harvard. And she's starting to think that she might not want to work at Harvard, but she's afraid that if she decides to quit her job and become a mom full time, that Lewis is going to see her in a different way and not see her as the warrior woman that he's in love with. And, but Lewis doesn't care about that. Lewis loves her for her, for who she is, not because she works at Harvard. And he says, look, whether you decide to work at Harvard or work at a coffee shop, I don't care. I would support you a thousand percent, no matter what you do. So I think things for them will eventually work out. Sheila just got to kind of figure out what she wants to, to do with her life. You know. <clears throat> so the next day, things really start going downhill. <clears throat> because you remember that deposition and that little phrase that the factory owner said about how he didn't give a damn that the two people died? Yeah. So he has that printed on, Mike has it printed on t-shirts, merch, and has his client wear it and sends the pictures out on social media everywhere for, for it to be seen by millions of people. And of course, this gets Mike really, this gets Harvey really peeved. He's like, dude, what the fuck? Really? Because now, even though, even though they've got Mike over a legal barrel, making their client look like shit. <laughs> so really, it's kind of a last Hail Mary parting shot. Yes, Mike knows that there's nothing he can do to win this case. It's pretty much done. But he's not going to go out without a fuck you. And that's basically his fuck you. <laughs> when Samantha sees this, she gets really pissed off. And she knows that if they don't come back with something soon to substantiate that he did, that the crack owner didn't know about it, that it doesn't matter what legal barrel they have, they're, they're fucked. But there is no proof. 
unless she manufactures some. And, that, and Harvey immediately knows that that's what her tack is, because that's, that's what she always does. Every time she gets into a, a corner, she'll attack by coming out with some either trumped up shit or she'll dig some, some shit up about you. So Harvey manages to convince her to not do that because that is not the type of person, he knows that's not who she wants to be. At first she figures, she thinks he's just trying to defend his prodigal son. But he's like, no, look, it's not just about Mike, it's about us too. It's about this place and this firm. Don't forget Faye's here. If she sees that, you're done. We cannot handle any more upheaval. If you want to take Mike out, do it the right way. Period. You can't just manufacture some, some shit because he pissed you off. You cannot constantly do that. It seems like he manages to get her to back down. And they figure, and he figures, okay, well, whew, dodge that bullet, everything's okay. So that night after work, he's back at his place with Donna. They've got a whole setup there, wine, cheese. Red, they're gonna hang out with, with Mike and chill for Mike's last last night there before he goes home. Mike shows up and he looks like he's ready to tear Harvey a new one. Harvey's like, what? What? <laughs> Apparently, Samantha did exactly what Harvey told her not to do. She manufactured some bullshit evidence that would corroborate that the factory owner didn't know anything about it. Mike feels that Harvey was the one that did it at first because it's the kind of thing that Harvey's been known to do in the past. But he forgets how much Harvey's changed over the years, quite a bit of which Mike himself was responsible for. He's like, look, dude, I didn't do this. Donna backs him up. Mike Harvey didn't do this. Well, if it wasn't you, then it was her. And you let her do it, you knew, and you let her do it, and you didn't stop. And that's even worse. In Mike's mind, he feels like Harvey's not the same person that he once was, because the Harvey he knows would never let innocent people be exploited and be hurt like that just to save a client who doesn't deserve to be fucking saved. He feels like Harvey is the one that's, you know, Mike was accusing him of having lost sense of who he is after moving, because they were, they started battling back forth, like, you know, you don't show, you don't call, you don't write for a fucking year, then you show the fuck up right when you have a fucking case. I'm like, really? Seriously? You don't even bother to, like, to, to come by ever at all? Visit your your old friends only when when, when you have work? And of course, Mike bites, bites back, too, and they look like they're about to rip, rip each other's faces off. This episode was very much themed about, around, losing oneself or understanding one's self-identity. You had Sheila who felt like she was losing a terrible part of herself because she wanted to move on from Harvard, but she wasn't sure if she should because she was afraid she was going to lose that part of herself that made her who she was. And you had Katrina who has really no understanding of herself because she's dedicated her entire life to her work. So she has to figure out how to be happy with herself and have a relationship with herself. And you have Harvey, who thinks that Mike has lost himself when, by moving to C Seattle and not being around as much as he used to be. But that's really not true. Mike is the same person that he was. I mean, he does things a little bit differently, but not by too much. And he does a lot of things the way that Harvey used to do them, because that's what he knows. And then you've got Mike thinking that Harvey's also lost sense of who he is because he's letting Samantha just get away with all this shit and do whatever she wants to do. And these people are paying the price. So that same night, he goes back to the office and he's like, what the fuck did you just do? I told you, you cannot manufacture evidence. You're gonna bring all of us down if you keep this shit up. I thought you had said you weren't gonna do this. And she's like, well, yes I did, but I changed my, my mind because this is my client and I'm not gonna let them go down. And if that means I have to manufacture some shit, then I'm gonna do it. 
they get into a shouting match, and unfortunately, as they're doing so, who happens to be walking by, who is within listening distance? Yeah, you guessed it, Faye. She hears their argument, and the next day, she goes to confront uh, Samantha. At first, she accuses Harvey of being the one to manufacture evidence, but I think she knew all along that it wasn't, because it's, it's not like the glass is soundproof. They were being pretty loud, so I'm fairly certain that she could hear all of it. I think she all already knew. I think it was more of a test on her part to see whether or not Samantha would come clean or if she would throw Harvey under the bus. But she didn't. I will, I will give her that much, that she did not allow Harvey to go down for something that he didn't do. But Faye already knew that no matter what she said, someone was getting fired. It wasn't Harvey that did it, it was Samantha that did it, so, oh my god, Samantha, big surprise, right? Samantha pays the price. It's like, you know what? Could have told you. Could have told you. You had started down this road a long time ago. And you knew when Faye came here, she was adamant. Absolutely adamant. Don't pull this horse shit. But of course, and you didn't think she was serious? That she wasn't going to fire people if they got out of line? Come on. This woman's got brass balls the size of Jupiter. So, yeah. Now, uh, Samantha's out of a job because she fucked up. Last thing to note is that Lewis goes over to Mike's apartment and he's in the midst of packing up to catch his flight. And he is worrying that, because he knows that this case has had some serious fallout for everybody. But he knows how close Mike and Harvey are, and he doesn't want to see that friendship sacrificed because of work. He doesn't want to see them lose what they have because of it. And he tells him, look, Harvey and I used to bite each other's heads off at work. We used to come to literal physical blows. But at the end of the day, that stuff stayed at work. And it didn't spill over into after work. We were still friends then, and we're still friends now. And I don't want to see you guys lose that. You guys are too close and too important to each other to sacrifice that because of this bullshit. I mean, even if you don't want to call him now, maybe when you get home, you can try and call him again and just talk, you know, and make sure everything's out. Mike is kind of hesitant. So I don't know where it's going to go from there. I don't think that they're going to lose their friendship because the two of them are too tight. To lose a friendship over this mess. But it might be a little while before they talk again. Uh, and Mike gives Lewis a little uh, baby onesie that says, You've been spit up so twelve. And I'm telling you, I think it suits merch that was altered. Because <laughs> I know some of the some of the actors have this merch. And, uh, he just gave it to him as a gift for for his new baby. And uh, Harvey tells Samantha that, you know, I tried to have your back. I defended you to Faye. I defended you to Mike, even when I shouldn't have, because you're my friend and you're a part of this team. But no more. I'm done. I can't keep defending you because I can't trust you. Which, you know, I get it. She broke his trust. They agreed on what they were going to do, and she went behind his back. She has a penchant for doing this shit, which is why she tends to work alone. I knew when Faye showed up that if anybody was going to go down first, it was going to be her, because she has this inability to not be able to stop herself from doing stupid shit. She's so used to doing things a certain way, and getting results in those in that certain way, whether it's digging somebody's dirt up or manufacturing some, some shit, it is very difficult for her to scale herself back. And I know in the forthcoming episodes, 
promo for episode six shows them all the meeting up on the roof dis discussing where to go from here, you know, where, how, how to go on further without Samantha there. And they want to find a way to get Samantha back. And that way I'm guessing is to take Faye down somehow. But how do you take on a member of the bar when really she was right in what she did? I mean, I don't particularly like Faye either, but she was right. She manufactured evidence. That's illegal. She literally could probably, if Faye wanted, she could probably go to jail. The fact that she lost her job is minuscule compared to what Faye could have done. You know, so I can't really fault Faye for it because Samantha should have done it. Flat out. I mean, and let's not forget, Mike came into this knowing exactly what he was going to do. He had, he had this shit set up way beforehand. She, he, Arby told her. Donna told her, don't underestimate Mike. You think just because he's young that he's inexperienced? Uh-uh, uh-uh. If you're getting worked here for seven years, he knows his shit. He knows his shit. And boy, does he ever. Well, that's another episode in the can, guys. Uh, we'll see you again next week for episode six. I cannot believe that we were already halfway through the season. Can you believe that? Oh, only five more episodes left. Five weeks. So bad. <laughs> well, anyway, guys, I will see you next week for episode six. You guys have a nice night. Peace out, yo. Good night.